Good morning. My name is Klaus Grabinski. I'm judge at the Federal Court of Justice in German Bundesgerichtshof, where I'm allocated with the 10th division that is mainly dealing with patent litigation. I'm also a member of an advisory committee uh, for the uh, preparatory committee of the Unified Patent Court. And you are listening to IP Friday. <music> Hello and welcome to this episode of IP Fridays. Our names are Ken Suzanne and Rolf Clayson, and this is the podcast dedicated to intellectual property. It does not matter where you are from, in-house or private practice, novice or expert. We will help you stay up to date with current topics in the fields of trademarks, patents, design and copyright, discover useful tools, and much more. Welcome to episode 74 of IP Fridays. Today's interview guest is Judge Klaus Grabinski of the Federal Court of Justice in Germany, the Bundesgerichtshof, and he's also a member of the drafting committee of the Unified Patent Court. And I had the chance to chat with him about current issues of the Unified Patent Court. But before we jump into this, uh, Ken will tell us about the Amazon Echo and if the communication with the Amazon Echo is com protected by the First Amendment. And before all this, I just wanted to let you know that Italy um, just ratified the Unified Patent Court Agreement on the 10th of February. So it has become the 12th uh, country to ratify the UPC Agreement. And there are only Great Britain and Germany left to ratify the agreement so it can enter into force. And this is expected for March of this year. So hopefully we will have good news for you in the next episode. So Ken, is the communication between the Amazon Echo and the users protected by the First Amendment in the US? Rolf, does the First Amendment protect communications between an Amazon Echo device, a cylinder-shaped speaker gadget hooked up to the internet, and the users that are speaking out commands to this electronic device? The answer is yes, according to Amazon.com. Amazon.com believes that the First Amendment does protect spoken requests to Amazon's Alexa, the name of the female voice tied in with the Echo device, and the responses that it doles out on demand. This issue is taking center stage in an Arkansas courtroom, where Amazon.com is arguing it should not have to turn over this type of evidence unless law enforcement is able to meet a higher burden of proof. The case is a criminal murder case where authorities are alleging that James Andrew Bates killed another man by the name of Victor Collins in November 2015. Collins was found dead in a hot tub located in Bates' house in Bentonville, Arkansas. In connection with this murder investigation, the police procured a search warrant to obtain all of the digital communications between the Amazon Echo device located in Bates' house. This includes the subscriber and purchase data associated with the particular device, as well as transcriptions of the voice exchanges between the device and its users. The search warrant signed by an Arkansas judge enumerated the following types of evidence from Bates' Echo device audio recordings, transcribed records, tax records, and other data. While Amazon has already handed over the subscriber and purchase data, they do not believe that the transcriptions of the voice exchanges, namely between the accused Bates and the Amazon Echo, should be handed over. According to Amazon.com, the First Amendment affords protection to these types of communications because it is included under the, quote, right to receive, the right to read, and freedom of inquiry, close quote, without government examination. Amazon also contends that the responses doled out by Alexa on the Amazon Echo constitute, quote, constitutionally protected opinion, close quote. Amazon is arguing in this case that in order to turn over the disputed information, prosecutors will need to demonstrate that the data is not available any anywhere else and that the data is sufficiently related to the facts in this case. A hearing is set for March 17th in this case, where Bates continues to assert that he is innocent. For IP Fridays, I'm Ken Suzanne. 
That is a very interesting point. And I personally hope that uh, robots and computers will not have the same rights as uh, humans uh, with regard to speech. But let's see how this case turns out. Thank you, Ken. So let's jump into the interview with Judge Kabinski. I'm very excited to be joined by Judge Klaus Kabinski today. If you don't know who Klaus Kabinski is, he is judge at the Federal Court of Justice in Germany. He is also a member of the drafting committee of the Unified Patent Court. He is also a member of an expert panel um, to the preparatory committee. And he basically uh, made all the rules of the Unified Patent Court. So thank you for being on the show today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Klassen. Actually, uh, it was not only me who did uh, all the work. Actually, it was a whole committee, and, um, and the main work uh, was with uh, the chairman, of course, Kevin Mooney, and uh, some other members, uh, namely uh, Winfried Tillman. Of course. So what do you think are the main strengths of the UPC system? Well, I think uh, the main strength you can uh, get aware of when you compare it to the current situation. Well, currently, if you want to enforce a European patent, um, not only in one national uh, jurisdiction, but in a number of uh, national jurisdictions, then, you, of course, you have to go to a different court and uh, start different uh, uh, parallel litigations. And this, of course, is uh, not only time-consuming, but also an expensive exercise. Um, the uh, UPC system uh, will uh, allow uh, a patent owner who, uh, to, to go to just one court and uh, uh, litigate uh, his patent there. That, this is, I think, the main at, uh, strength or advantage of the UPC system. However, there are other uh, positive uh, effects uh, of the system. One, of course, is that it can be expected that it will help to harmonize uh, uh, the interpretation of European patent law. As you may be aware, already currently, uh, um, most uh, uh, patent provisions like the European Patent Convention, but also uh, provisions of um, infringement law uh, in the national uh, uh, laws are, uh, are the same. But sometimes uh, the courts gave it different interpretations. Uh, and uh, it can be expected that the Unified Patent Court uh, will have an influence on these national uh, jurisdictions in order to further harmonize uh, uh, also a national uh, case law uh, in, 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 uh, in the field of patents. And um, just a question uh, to that exactly. Um, some decisions are very short, for example, in France. Some are really, really long <laughs> in Great Britain. Do you think there will be also harmonization as to the form of the decisions? I'm not sure whether there will be a harmonization uh, with regard to the national uh, decisions because the national decisions in patent law, of course, have also to be to uh, to 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 uh, be harmonized in their respective national system. However, I think this is interest. It will be interesting to see um, which kind of format. Uh, the UPC uh, will adopt with regard to judgments, whether it will be more the French way or the UK way or the German way or uh, any other national approach, or uh, whether they will find some new formula, uh, if I may put it like this, some new formula how to, to draft a, a judgment. I think what is, I think is important is that you will not have in the uh, London division more or less a UK format in the French, uh, in the Paris division uh, of the UPC, uh, more or less French format, and in the Dusseldorf uh, division, more or less German format. I think it should be a common format for all uh, divisions uh, of the Unified Patent Court. Mm -hmm. Um, I also have a very political question for you, um, and uh, I would be glad if you could answer that. Um, uh, can you give us your thoughts on whether you think there is a way that the UK will be able to continue to be part of the UPC system? Well, uh, you, 
you and, uh, of course, uh, the listeners will be aware of the declaration of uh, the um, UK Minister of Intellectual Property from November of last year, uh, where uh, the minister said that uh, uh, the UK will proceed with preparations to ratify the Unified Patent Court Agreement. And uh, on this basis, I'm confident that this is going to happen uh, in spring of this year. So once uh, UK has ratified the UPC agreement, and uh, later during the year, uh, this, uh, uh, the, the agreement has also been ratified by Germany, the necessary number of states uh, in order to have um, the, the, the agreement come into force has been reached. And so it can be expected that the whole uh, system is going to start. Um, some say in December of this year, uh, um, but it could also be a, a few months later. Uh, but it is going to, to, to happen uh, rather soon. So then, of course, the question uh, is uh, what effect might a possible uh, UK uh, Brexit in about two years' time have on a then running a UPC system. Well, I'm not a politician, and I think this is mainly a problem for the politicians to solve. However, from a legal point of view, I think it would be possible that UK remains in the UPC system even after a possible Brexit. This, of course, has to be negotiated between, on the one hand, the participating member states and, to some extent, maybe also by the EU, but this is still a very uh, open uh, question, and, on the other side, uh, by the uh, UK. As far as the agreement is concerned, um, you currently will read that only a uh, member state can be a member, EU member state can be also a member state of the uh, UPCA. However, um, if everybody agrees, uh, this uh, can be amended. And uh, with regard to the uh, uh, um, European pattern with unitary effect, it is also up to negotiations and finally an agreement between both sides uh, whether a UK will still be part of it. Um, um, the the ba legal basis for uh, the UK still being part of a European pattern with unify, a unitary effect uh, would be uh, uh, Article 142 of the European uh, Patent Convention and which would allow uh, uh, which allows a group of uh, member states of the uh, European patent system to have a common patent and uh, currently it, it will be uh, a group of EU member states that have this uh, sharing uh, EU patent but in the future it could also be a number of EU member states plus UK mm -hmm. Very interesting opinion. That will be very interesting for our listeners to hear. <laughs> so another question regarding the UK. Um, what happens when a unitary patent is granted before the Brexit and then someone wants to enforce it in the UK after the Brexit? Well, this, again, very heavily uh, depends on what will be negotiated and finally agreed to. Uh, by, on the one hand, the participating member states, and on the other hand, the uh, UK. So if UK will stay in the UPC system even after Brexit, I think nothing uh, uh, will change. Right. Um, enforcement is a matter of the respective national law. And so uh, um, uh, if the, uh, um, a decision of the UPC will have to be enforced in the UK, then it will be um, under uh, the conditions of UK uh, law. Some so-called experts are advising to opt out for all patents and then opt in once they see use to, uh, to need the UPC system for enforcement. What are your thoughts? 
Well, actually, uh, I'm not really convinced uh, of of this uh, kind of tactic. Um, I think uh, the uh, the owner of a European patent uh, will have uh, to make up his her mind uh, once a UPCA system has come into force, or even better, before uh, uh, using um, the uh, the so-called sunrise period. So. If the individual analysis says, I'm fine with the current system, I'm fine with the system where I, when I want to um, enforce my patent, I have to go to uh, 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 the national courts, and possibly if I want to enforce it in more than one country, I have to go to uh, more than one national court, and I'm fine with this situation, then it might be an option to say, okay, we are going to opt out. Our patent. However, if the analysis says, "Well, we want to have, uh, uh, we want to, uh, to, to, uh, to, there may be in a situation in which we have to enforce our patent in the future, and it's much better to go to only one court instead to go to a number of courts." Um, then uh, I think uh, uh, the uh, uh, decision would be: Well, we, we we are not going to opt out. We we do nothing, so we stay in 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 in, in the new system. Uh, however, making this tactic something in between, having uh, picking uh, um, the best out of both uh, uh, approaches, I think is is a rather uncertain uh, um, approach, uh, because once. Uh, the patent owner has opted out for his patent. Um, he uh, uh, and uh, and uh, has in mind that he wants to uh, possibly get back in the system in order to enforce it before only one court, if necessary. This tactic can be undermined by a possible uh, competitor by uh, simply uh, starting. Uh, a, a revocation action before a national court once the, the patent has been opted out. Uh, and this w- would have uh, the consequence that uh, uh, an opt-in is no longer possible because I think m- at least the, the, the majority of uh, opinions is saying once uh, uh, you have opted out and a litigation has been started before one national court. There is no way back to the uh, uh, UPCA system. So that is a real danger um, that I see, um, that uh, if you are opting out your patents, there is a chance, uh, and that is not small, especially in very aggressive industries like, let's say, the pharmaceutical industry, that you will not be able to opt in again because some let's say, generic industry um, competitors uh, are challenging the patents on, in, on the national level. Exactly. And you, you put right. yourself into the uh, hands of somebody else. Right. And uh, this is, I think, always another very good situation. So better make up your mind whether you, uh, it's better for you to, to stay in or opt out, but don't do this uh, in-between tactics. Uh, that would be uh, my, um, my opinion on this uh, point. Right. Uh, I think it's also about building trust in the new system. Um, once we see who the judges are uh, or the, 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 o- the users of the system, once they see who the judges are, maybe they will be uh, more relaxed about this. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, I also talked to some litigators, in-house litigators uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, and some are saying, well, we just um, we don't opt out, but we just uh, will have national patents as well. So they'll have... Uh, um, EU, uh, the unitary patents, and they'll have national patents um, in parallel, so they can choose uh, what kind of system to use. Yes, I think this is a, a, is a possible uh, approach, and uh, it, uh, it uh, gives you um, more options as a patent owner. So, uh, yes, it, w- it would be a good idea 
uh, I think to 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 uh, keep this in in mind and possibly uh, make use of it if the system allows it. Right, and then we come to my next question: <laughs> double patenting. <laughs> um, to have the same pro uh, same uh, invention patented uh, in the with effect in the same country with different uh, different rights, basically. Um, Can you? Uh, some of our listeners may not be familiar with double patenting. What is the? Uh, can you briefly summarize what double patenting is and why uh, why it is so important uh, in the UPC agreement? Maybe I start with a little explanation with regard to the current situation. So uh, not under the UPC uh, system, but the current situation in Germany. So the standard situation is. Uh, that uh, uh, an applicant is applying f uh, in parallel for a German and a European patent, of course, including uh, Germany as a state where they want to get uh, protection. And uh, normally, uh, the German patent office is uh, uh, granting the patent uh, f uh, at f uh, first. And this, on this basis, a uh, 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 patent owner may start an infringement litigation before one of the German uh, district court that have uh, jurisdiction on patent uh, infringement litigation. And well, the litig litigation is uh, is uh, uh, pending, and uh, um, maybe half a year later, the European patent has been granted. Well, the effect for the uh, running uh, um, a German patent litigation normally uh, is uh, not important. Um, it is, uh, the, the law says, well, if uh, the, the patents are the same, then the German patent is no longer in force and is replaced by the German part of the European patent. And in the running litigation, it, it will simply be a notification, uh, some uh, notification from uh, the part of the uh, of the uh, of the, the claimant saying, "Well, now I'm basing, I'm uh, basis of my uh, litigation is no longer the German patent because it's no longer in force, uh, but the European patent that has replaced the German patent." And then the litigation goes on and no problem. Now, if this approach would apply also in the new system, then there would be a problem. Um, I'm not talking for, for a moment, I'm not talking on, uh, on, uh, about the transitional period. But uh, if we do not have the transitional period, then the problem would be as follows. Uh, the, the patent owner would start Uh, uh, the infringement uh, litigation before uh, the German district court. Then half a year later, the uh, the uh, European patent has been granted, but he cannot uh, 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 continue uh, the litigation before the German uh, court uh, based on the European patent because he has to bring uh, this litigation before the new court, the Unified Patent Court. And this would then end the uh, uh, the, the German uh, litigation. Of course, this is not uh, would not be a very uh, good situation. Uh, on on this basis, uh, the German legislator uh, was uh, thinking how to tackle the problem, how to find a good solution. Um, the the basic interest is on the one hand that enforcement also of a German patent should always be effective. On the other hand, it should be um, avoided that uh, uh, the defendant is uh, uh, attacked on a double track, meaning in parallel, based on the same uh, patent, on the German patent before the German court and on the European patent before the UPC. So in order to, uh, to uh, somehow balance these uh, interests, um, the, the German legislator came up in a, which is currently a draft, um, uh, with the following solution. Um, the uh, the uh, patent owners, of course, can still bring uh, an infringement uh, 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 action based on the German patent before the German court. Um, and as long as 
he is not starting a parallel litigation before the UPC. Uh, even a grant of the uh, of the European patent will not uh, uh, have will have no effect on on the German patent. So this means, unlike uh, in the current situation, uh, patent owner can continue litigation before the German court based on the German patent and get a judgment. However, if the uh, the, the uh, patent owner gets a European patent granted and starts a parallel litigation before the uh, UPC, then the defendant in the German litigation can uh, come up and uh, raise a defense, saying, well, now I'm sued in parallel before the UPC, and I, uh, I, uh, I have this as a defense in the German litigation, and this, this would mean the German litigation would be ended. Uh, so uh, this means, uh, on the one hand, uh, a German patent uh, can be uh, enforced before a German court without uh, being influenced by the grant of a European patent, so no longer a prohibition of double patenting. However, if a parallel litigation before the UPC uh, uh, is started, then as a procedural defense, the defendant can come up in the German litigation and say, oh, okay, they, now we have a parallel litigation and uh, uh, we, uh, I, I uh, uh, do not want to be any longer be uh, uh, um, sued before the German court and this would then uh, uh, finish the German litigation. So this is a kind of... Um, uh, I think uh, a very uh, well done, uh, very uh, um, good approach to balance the, 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 the legitimate interests on the one hand of the patent owner uh, to be able to also enforce German patent uh, and on the other hand, uh, the legitimate interest of the uh, defendant not to be sued with regard to the same patent before two courts, the German court and the, and the UPC. Yes, that was a very excellent um, um, solution to this problem, I think. <laughs> um, thank you very much for this very helpful explanation and uh, how the solution works now in Germany. Well, as I said, this is only uh, uh, currently a draft, uh, but uh, and we will see uh, there may be some um, uh, smaller amendments uh, during uh, the legislation, uh, legislative um, process before a uh, German parliament, uh, but I'm confident that this will more or less be also the solution uh, for the final uh, uh, law. And I think this solution reflects uh, the interests of all involved parties, the courts, the defendant and the claimant, so um, I think that's, uh, that, that will be a nice solution. Um, I have one uh, last question, if I may. Um, we are mostly representing medium-sized clients in Germany, and some are afraid that they cannot afford the high cost ceilings of the UPC system, and therefore will likely have German patents in the future instead of unitary patents. Um, what are your thoughts? Is the new system only for the large corporations? There is uh, some risk in this regard. Um, uh, I'm not fully convinced that it will be uh, like this, but there is a certain risk. Um, and this is not so much uh, due to the court fees. When you compare the court fees of the uh, Unified Patent Court to the court fees of German courts, I think they are pretty moderate. Uh, they even have a system where uh, medium-sized companies may uh, reduce uh, the court fees, which I have to, to mention in this context is very complicated and is one of the downsides, I think, of, uh, of the system. Um, uh, however, uh, medium-sized, uh, small and medium-sized companies do not have to make use of this. And it is really, it is not... Uh, 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 financially, it is not uh, very important. However, where the risk is, is uh, the um, 
is uh, about the recoverable costs of representation. And uh, well, the system is um, to some extent uh, similar to the German system and to some extent similar to uh, the UK system and maybe also other European systems. Well, if I may say the German part of it is um, that um, the court will uh, determine a value of action, which is the basis for the court fees, but also uh, for uh, the recoverable cost of representation. Um, however, unlike uh, the German system, where uh, once the uh, value of litigation has been determined, if you just look into a list and see, okay, this is going to be uh, the recoverable, the court fee and also the recoverable costs. Uh, in, uh, in the UPC system, there is only a ceiling for recoverable costs. So, uh, for example, if the value of litigation is 1 million euro, you look into the list and you see an up to a certain uh, uh, amount of euro, which is the ceiling for recoverable costs. And these sums are pretty high. And um, of course, uh, uh, um, at the end of the litigation, uh, and if parties do not agree out of court, uh, the court will have to make a decision on to what extent uh, uh, costs uh, will be uh, recoverable. But of course, there's a certain risk that it will get up to the ceiling and not uh, stop uh, somewhere below uh, the ceiling. And this, of course, is, uh, is a point uh, to, to, uh, that uh, makes me worry because the ceilings, as I said, uh, in my eyes are pretty high. And I think at some point of time, uh, the administrative committee who is um, dealing with the uh, and is determining uh, uh, the scale of ceilings for recoverable costs will have have to 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 deal with this matter and uh, maybe will have to to uh, to, to to lower these uh, ceilings uh, at a certain point of time. So the system, uh, this is the good news in this uh, context. The system uh, will be flexible in this regard, and it will be up to the administrative uh, uh, council. Uh, administrative committee uh, to um, to find out which is uh, uh, a fair number for uh, the ceiling with regard to a certain value of litigation. Mm. I think uh, this uh, ceiling is like a compromise between the UK system where patent litigation is rather expensive and the German system where patent litigation is rather inexpensive compared to other legislations. Um, Right, it is a compromise, uh, and uh, but still, of course, when the system is uh, is running, um, and there's always, uh, uh, I think, uh, there should be time for uh, thinking. Well, is it as it is uh, has been um, um, set up? Uh, is it still a good solution, or should we, to some extent, amend? Uh, uh, the, uh, the the ceilings and this of course will be for the administrative uh, committee to decide on right and um, it is probably not an accident that uh, out of about 2,000 patent litigation cases in Europe every year about 1,200 are uh, before German courts and only 50 in the UK <laughs> maybe um, that is only one maybe one reason is the cost <laughs> yes yeah, I'm not confirming uh, the numbers uh, but uh, um, of course, um, uh, the, 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 uh, I think it is uh, fair. Uh, it is fair saying uh, that uh, many small and middle-sized companies litigate um, um, uh, patent infringement uh, cases uh, before German courts, even if they are not uh, coming from Germany. Right. Well, this has been a very nice interview and very helpful for our listeners to understand the new UPC system. Thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure as always. That's it for this episode. If you liked what you heard, please show us your love by visiting ipfridays.com slash love and tweet a link to this show. 
we would be so grateful if you would do that. It would help us out to get the word out. Also, please subscribe to our podcast at ipfridays.com or on iTunes or Stitcher.com. If you have a question or want to be featured in one of the upcoming episodes, please send us your feedback at ipfridays.com slash feedback. Also, please leave us a review on iTunes. You can go to ipfridays.com slash iTunes, and it will take you right to the correct page on iTunes. If you want to get mentioned on this podcast or even have comments within the next episode, please leave us your voicemail at ipfridays.com slash voicemail. You have been listening to an episode of IP Fridays. The views expressed by the participants of this program are their own and do not represent the views of nor are they endorsed by their respective law firms. None of the content should be considered legal advice. The IP Fridays podcast should not be construed as legal advice or legal opinion on any specific facts or circumstances. The contents of this podcast are intended for general informational purposes only, and you are urged to consult your own lawyer on any specific legal questions. As always, consult a lawyer or patent or trademark attorney. Copyright 2014. All rights reserved.